Hey, folks, welcome back to the show. Uh, today's episode is on our one of our favorite topics here, right? This is what I talk about when I travel. This is what I talk about so often. And these are bioregulator peptides. And I've got a great guest for you today. Let's talk about the episode because I know you guys are just dying to hear about it. Now, could you potentially slow down or reverse your biological dum da dum death clock. In this episode of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast, I chat with Phil Mikens about the effect of peptides on epigenetics and their potential for promoting healthy aging. We unlock the secrets of slowing down our biological death clock and the promising potential of bioregulators in various health contexts. We share real success stories where individuals have experienced noticeable improvements in bladder and prostate health thanks to these peptides. We also cover post-cancer treatments, including the use of melatonin and peptides, such as the pineal and thymus peptides, which, as you know, are one and two at the top of my list of must-have bioregulators. Lastly, we discuss the benefits and risks of using growth hormones in its different forms, such as GHRPs, growth hormone-releasing peptides, and even touch on sermorelin. Now, who is Phil Mikens? Phil Mikens studied food and vitamin technology at South London College and after that, he completed, an applied, he completed an applied science bachelor's degree from Rochville in pharmacy. He also holds a master's degree in biochemistry from the University of Canterbury, and having been actively involved in the, active, in the anti-aging field since the 1980s, Phil has had conversations with some of the top names in this field. Um, he's held the positions of editor-in-chief of the anti-aging magazine, director of research and development to inner age, co-writer of the New Millennial Guide to Anti-Aging Medicine, and chairman of the International Anti-Aging Congress. He's also advisor to the British Longevity Society, so this man knows of what he speaks. Now, if you want to get your hands on some bioregulator peptides and some other really amazing longevity products, just head on over to profound-health.com and use discount code LONGEVITY15 on your first order to save 15%. All right, let's jump into the episode. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that all of the information presented in this podcast is for information purposes only. No medical advice, no diagnosing, no treatments suggested here. Before you try anything that you hear about or learn about here, make sure that you check with your medical provider. Bill Mikens, welcome back to the show. It is always such a pleasure to have you here. Absolute pleasure to be back with you too, Natalie. Yes. Well, we Phil, you know, I think this is our third episode together, right? And Thank it's you. we've always I mean, first of all, we always kind of do the podcast before the podcast <laughs> like catching up. But it's um well. but I'm really looking forward to this because I think I think that for the audience, you know, we I think more and more people now, both because I stand fairly often on a soapbox, you've been on a couple of other really big podcasts. People are starting to really come around to this idea of these bioregulators um, as epigenetic influence, epigenetic switches in the body that can really influence, you know, in both from a therapeutic and from um, I don't know what the the other word is really, but and, and maybe right. healthy aging, healthy aging yeah, perspective, yeah. right? So absolutely, absolutely, um, and so. We just can't get enough information. And so here no, we are because fine. you, sir, are a fountain of information. So. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> My so, wife doesn't. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when it, we, we, we leave spouses out of these things because you know what they know. So at the end I'm of the right. day, you know, I think w one of the things we talked about earlier that I've really been leaning into recently as a concept is, you know, we get, I mean, people hear about bioregulator peptides and, and I would invite people to go back to some of the earlier episodes because we talk about a lot of the basics there. But mm -hmm. people hear about bioregulator peptides and they're like, holy geez, you know, I can I can renew my pancreas. I can restore function to my liver. I can I can make my brain new again, which is all maybe true to a point. Mm -hmm. but, but I think the piece that people often miss is what should probably happen before you do that? And how mm -hmm. important is it to address the terrain that we're introducing these peptides into so that they can really work their magic. And I know we both have great stories from people we've talked to and worked with. Like I have a woman in my community recently 
who within, I think it was less than a month after starting a bioregulator protocol that literally saw changes in her blood work. And right. yet we get other people who use bioregulators and they get nothing, right? Mm. So maybe, mm. you know, you want to speak to that a little bit about this whole interesting paradigm of from transformational yeah. to nothing. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, of course, um, as a recovering pharmacist, um, we can um, <laughs> we can Love think it. about uh, various factors that the patient might be doing that that might be incorrect. Are they dosing correctly? Would be the sure. first question to ask. Secondly, are they actually taking the right peptides in the first place? Right. Absolutely. One of the things we know about the bioregulators is they that's what they are bioregulator. If you're low, they will increase it. If you're high, they will decrease it. So, but if so, if you're already in an optimal range. They do nothing. So it's possible the patient has identified the wrong peptides. It's possible. Mm -hmm. But I think also what you're alluding to is that, uh, and uh, as we said earlier, I, I view it like a pyramid. Mm -hmm. So health is a pyramid. And the base of the pyramid, which is the stuff you have to do most often and a lot of, are the common sense lifestyle factors. Mm -hmm. We all know what they are. It's good food, exercise, de-stress. You know, and we can do natural detox things like, for example, taking saunas would be absolutely. You know, yeah. So those that stuff that we need to do very regularly, the as we go up the pyramid and we get into more specialized things, they could be everything from bioidentical hormones, peptide stem cells, whatever you want to go down the road of. There's, they have one thing in common. If you're not doing a decent base to start with the chances of them making any radical changes is very small. You know, taking the peptides, for example, is not an excuse to eat McDonald's every day and drink mm -hmm. beer every night, okay? Mm -hmm. Still got to do the basics. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. A lot of people think, and the, here's a weird one. Here's a curveball for you, okay? Um, they're gene switches. We know these bioregulators, they're in foods, they're gene switches, it explains the epigenetics of food, right? Mm -hmm. But think of it like a building site. The genes, if you will, are the managers. They're the guys who are saying, right, put that wall over there, you know, make that window this big and all this sort of thing. But you need the materials. Mm -hmm. You still need the foundational materials. Yeah. You know, in other words, the right food, etc. So if you're not, if the supplies aren't on site, then it doesn't matter how many managers you have, not much is going to get done, okay? Yeah. So these two things have to come together. And, of course, there's this added thing, which is, and it could, we could use a building site analogy for this again, which is waste removal, right? Yes. You dig a big hole, what are you going to do with all that earth? You've got to get rid of it. Otherwise, yeah. nothing, the work can't continue. So those factors have to be present. And if they are present and you're adding the peptides, then the magic really happens. Yeah, no, I love that. And, you know, when we talk about removing the waste, we're talking about things like that we all are exposed to. Can we reduce our viral load by doing some kind of therapy that helps to bring, you know, even things like cat's claw or mm -hmm. antimicrobials, doing a kind of like a cellular cleanse detox using a senolytic compound, whether mm -hmm. it's a couple of days a month or once a week, you know, even and taking it to, to a freebie fasting on a regular basis, even a 24 hour fast is going to have some benefits. So Absolutely. helping the body to clear out the trash and then also to remove some of these, like what, or at least, and we can't always remove things, but can we reduce the load of the yeah. heavy metals and the viruses and the bacteria that we all carry to some degree to right now, kind of clear the way? Oh, it's all good stuff. Right now, Bill Falloon, who's mm -hmm. the man who started the Life Extension Foundation, I have deepest respect for Bill. He also runs another organization, which guys can check out, called the Age Reversal Network. Mm -hmm. And they're organizing trials for people to go into. And what's unique about these trials, not only the, the, the kind of things they're going to be doing, but the multitude of things they're going to be doing. Because the problem with the drug trials today is it's one problem, one drug. Yeah. And, and the big fixes don't come like that. They come when you use a multitude of approaches. So you folks might want to go there and look up his stair-step approach to biological age control. Nice. Bit of a mouthful. 
Oh, but that's what he's got. And there are these, there's this staircase of steps and each step is labeled. Now there were about nine steps, if I remember rightly, I'm not going to go into them all now, but there's a step like called activating AMPK. Yeah. There's a step called mTOR. There's yeah. a step called Synalytics. Okay. Yeah. It's set as a step for NAD. Okay. So, and of course there are multiple things you can do to make that step. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, but that I think is one of the most interesting um, uh, things that I've seen recently to say this could be the at the present the best package if you did all these steps. Yeah. Then, and it's a bit like what you've just been talking about, Nath. It's a bit like introducing the right materials, uh, removing those toxins, and then adding in these special things that will get us to the top of the stairs, as it were. Yeah. So. And- Mm. I, I love the concept of biological age control. You know, everybody's running around talking about biological age reversal, which, you know, we've we've seen right when in Bill Lawrence's work in other people's work that, you know, to some degree, biological age reversal is is possible. What it actually means, you know, I think time will tell mm-hmm. um, if all these people who are running around with a biological age that's eight or 10 or 20 years younger than their chronological age. Is this really going to translate into a longer lifespan and health span, right? Because health span is that that thing we really yeah. are after. Um, yeah. And I think time will tell because it's the first time in his in human history yeah. that we've really paid attention to these things and have figured out both how to meaningfully execute it and measure it. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, there's famous people like Aubrey de Grey, who is, is all about, you know, um, fixing things as it were, as it goes along. But it doesn't overcome. I still have in the back of my mind, you know, is there a death clock? Um, yeah. Like you know, that grim we, age, the grim age exactly. death clock. Yeah. And there's certain evidences that there are those. It doesn't mean to say that you can't slow it down or maybe even reverse it or maybe stop it in the future. But I think there is such a thing. And I think all of us in our lives have had experiences of relatives or whatever who have, are seemingly going along very well. And then suddenly within two or three weeks, they go downhill very quickly and die. And that was actually shown at a study in Amsterdam. In tw- It was published in 2015, I think it was, if I remember rightly, where they drew the blood of um, centenarians. Mm-hmm. And one lady who was a super centenarian, which means she was over 110, and they do a tiny amount of blood and they evaluated their blood for stem cell activity and telomere length. And in every case, they found that in the last two to three weeks of life, there was dramatic shortening of telomeres and a dramatic reduction in stem cell activity. Mm -hmm. Now, the question then is, is that cause or is that consequence? But in my mind, maybe it's the signal of the death clock. Yeah, it could be. if, If there is a death clock, where's it most likely to be? I would suggest in the pineal gland. For sure. Because it's a counter. Yeah. So there, there may be other obstacles to overcome. But, hey, here's the really good news. Wouldn't it be nice to live a long life healthily? Absolutely. Right. So you you brought up something earlier that I think is an interesting thing to unpack for people a little bit, because there are still plenty of people, me included, who are pretty healthy. And we are still using those bioregulators. And to your point, we don't always necessarily feel feel the difference. Mm -hmm. But what we're hoping to do or what we're aiming for is Dr. Kavinson speaks about this 42% biological reserve, right? So think of it as, you know, it's just like this potential that's unexploited. And think Mm -hmm. of yourself going through life as wearing out natural wear and tear on parts, never mind all the stuff we're exposed to, like the toxins and the non-native EMFs and the stresses and the bad lifestyle decisions and all the things. So Imagine that if homeostasis is here, just from regular day-to-day life, we are moving south, mm-hmm. downwards from homeostasis naturally. It's like, to your, you know, to use your analogy of a car, the wheels are going to wear out. The tires mm-hmm. will wear out, not the wheels. Mm-hmm. The tires will wear out over time. So as a healthy kind of person who doesn't have any major issues, to me, using the bioregulators kind of flips those switches to encourage a repair of sorts or a recovery, if you will, of mm. that natural wear and tear so that I just kind of refresh my parts. I maybe found a way to refresh the treads 
on my tires instead of just watching them go down and down and down. Do you, how do you feel about that as a concept kind of thing? And in that sense, I don't have to use them necessarily. I mean, I'm trying to reverse my biological age with bills. So that's a different story. But if I was not doing that, I would just, I wouldn't use my bioregulators quite as often and it's necessarily as high a dose, but I sure would like to give that signal to my system to renew periodically. Yeah. Yeah. I think, it is necessary to give a signal to the system periodically as things are today. And I think we also face that challenge that we constantly change. Yeah. You know, at what age of our life, we are constantly changing. Yep. Um, and we have to address those changes. And those changes will probably be different next year to what they were this year. Mm-hmm. And so we unfortunately, we can't stay in limbo land saying, these are the three things I do, and I will continue doing those three things forever and ever. Amen. I think right. you have to, at least once a year, I would suggest, keep an eye on things and, and do adaptations as and when they're necessary. I find it fascinating that the numbers of sort of 30, 40% of biological reserve also go hand in glove with the age limits. I mean, when you think about it, the average yeah. person in the West dies at about 80 and yet we know that the maximum is at least 120. Yeah. So we always seem to be looking at this sort of 30, 40 percent number mm-hmm. all the time. It's Well, so it I seems think- a constant, right, in nature. That's a really – that is a great point. One of the things you may not know, Natalie, is uh, 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 Professor Cavanson very briefly at last October's Profound Health Summit in England very quickly flashed a slide up of work that he's been doing with, in Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv University – on plants and they're using the same peptides in certain plants and they've shown that growing strawberries that the strawberries that are using particular peptides produce about wait for it 30 percent more fruit than the ones who don't (laughs) there's that number again which peptides are helping the strawberries that's what i Uh, I knew you'd ask me that and i don't recall it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're going to have to go back to that recording, Phil. You and me, pe- <laughs> but looking his, for his that point, snippet. His, his point in the slide of the day um, was really to say these same peptides are extremely fundamental in nature. They're addressing plants, they're addressing animals, and they're addressing us. Yeah. So they're, they're absolutely fundamental. They're gene switches. That's, that's, that's what yeah. they're doing. Well, absolutely. And I think what I find the most fascinating about the bioregulators, which I've, you know, when I'm when I'm speaking about them doing whatever I do, the thing that I keep coming back to is that it is this it's the it's probably the most sophisticated, you know, let's call it biological age control that mm. we have access to that comes straight from nature. Mm. Like mm. it's not a chemical that somebody dreamed up in a lab. It's not a a right. therapy that somebody created. It's it's literally, it, it, and to your point, it exists in food it, now in varying degrees. Mm-hmm. And so it's it, this is why I think it's such a fascinating topic and part mm-hmm. of what makes it so safe. I, so exactly. I think that's a really key point there. If we remember that these were developed during the Soviet Union and that for 40 years they were giving them to literally millions of people. Uh, in fact, Fred Gavinson said at the same show, he reckons that they've been dosed over 100 million times. Yes. And no serious side effects, yeah. which is kind of what you'd expect from eating most foods, mm-hmm. isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, really expect to be violently ill from Brussels sprouts, so or no. whatever. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, <didn't> think that <laughs> um, so, I love Brussels uh, sprouts. <laughs> I'm just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, there is something very fundamental about them. Um, a, a few um, little stories that I can tell you since we we last spoke. Yeah, I would. Well, you know, I love stories, and I definitely <laughs> want to dig into. There's a few little. Little things I want to dig into as well, but okay. you start with the stuff. We we love story time. Entertain thank us. <laughs> well, I um, thank you. I'll try. Entertain and um, educate. That's that's your <laughs> mantra. that's your mantra. I'm, I'm not a good singer or dancer though, so beware. Um, that's all right. You got great story. <laughs> but I, a few weeks ago, I went to the Bahamas, um, which was a nice place to go to anyway. But I went there for business, and I actually went to listen to what was predominantly stem cell conference. Yeah, and. One for me to brush up because it's an area I really don't know much about, but also to go with certain ideas. And 
one of the things I was able to kind of introduce there at the show was I think these peptides could be a real help to stem cell clinics in that one of the biggest challenges all the stem cell clinics face is directing those stem cells to do what the patients want them to do. Absolutely. Okay. So um, there's a whole thing there. But I think that using peptides, if uh, possibly before, during and even after mm -hmm. the various stem cell therapies could really help in certain areas. Um, secondly, we're now beginning to hear and see evidences that the bone marrow peptide is increasing the activity of innate stem cells. Yeah, which is so, huge. Which is big, right? Yeah. So I think that might be a sleeper in the range currently, that people go, oh, what do I want to take the bone marrow peptide for? Well, if you want to, in, right? So I think we've got to keep an eye on that one to see, see what comes out of that. Now, the second story, I wish I could elaborate a bit more, but a doctor in London, um, lovely lady, she was giving uh, a patient, I can't remember the condition this patient had, but basically his bladder was in a in a mess it was it needed stretching apparently they were thinking of doing some surgical intervention to stretch the bladder now i that sounds not... highly unpleasant but yeah, yeah okay exactly. i don't know <laughs> why or what but of course he was not having a comfortable life and the, the doc said i think we need surgery we'll stretch the bladder this will help so she put him on the bladder peptide which again is one of those that you start thinking well what's this really for oh. um and <laughs> within two months the surgery was cancelled. Cancelled, yeah. It wasn't required. So something interesting going on there, which is at the moment unexplained. The third one is I keep hearing from two particular doctors who are raving about the brain peptide or, to give it its better analogy, CNS peptide. Yeah. Alzheimer's patients, seeing big improvements in Alzheimer's patients. So that obviously... In collaboration with other therapies, I would guess. It in is in collaboration. With, with, yeah. But they saw specific improvements when the yeah. brain well, peptide. Was well, it's interesting. You know, in that little book that your friend Marius, I can never say his last name properly, wrote, he makes so many of these cases where, for example, there was one on COPD where mm -hmm. they the half the, the group of COPD patients were given a, a conventional therapy and the other half of the group were given the conventional therapy. And I think it was the lung bioregulator that they were given as well. Mm -hmm. And in the group that where they combined the conventional therapy with the lung bioregulator, they actually saw better results faster yeah. than the people. Yeah. And so, you know, it's funny that that we think about these things as an either or and yet if we bring, if we could bring the two worlds together, it doesn't. And I mean, if we can avoid the drug altogether, yay, that's amazing. But in yeah. some cases, where I mean, let's face it, there is some benefit to modern medicine. <laughs> like no, you know, no, no, people absolutely. would die in certain cases yeah. without a certain antibiotic. As much yeah. as we love to hate the antibiotics, if you were in pain, you take painkiller. If you were in severe pain, you take exactly. A pain so it's, it's the luxuries of modern life, we can call it. But at the same time, to bring these things on board, either before, like you, you talk about with the bladder, to see if it can help. And also we want to go beyond treating the symptoms, don't we? Yeah, exactly. So many drugs treat symptoms, they don't treat the cause. I can relate a story here. Um, it was actually our accountant, and uh, he was a, he's a Malaysian gentleman, and um, he, uh, unfortunately, he vaped a lot. Oh, gosh. And, yeah, and he was buying these vapes from China because they were cheap. And he was always vaping. Whenever he saw him, he was vaping. Well he screwed his lungs up big time and mm -hmm. he got to the point life-changing stuff and he got to the point where they they said uh, lung transplant oh, and gosh. It, you know he, i'm not saying he was in a good place at all obviously if you're being prescribed a lung transplant you're not <laughs> uh, but he almost begrudgingly tried the lung peptide and within days although it wasn't a pleasant experience he was coughing up thick mucus blackened brown mucus it was clearing his lungs you're kidding and he didn't have a lung transplant in the end i'm not saying he's in the best place in the world yeah but he well, didn't get surgery okay. so that was that was a shocker 
because I really mm. didn't expect to see it, and especially that fast within days. That's so, amazing. Uh, that, that was amazing. And so, uh, how much? So, let me ask you this because everybody listening is going, "Well, wait a minute. How? Go back to that bladder guy. How many pa- <laughs> capsules was he taking a day? And how many capsules is lung guy? Just two, but you can take more." Right. It was just a day. But and this is another thing I'd love to talk about, because this is and I'm more stories. Right. I mean, I have a story of an 85 year old gentleman who mm. could not sleep through the night because he had to go to the bathroom multiple times. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, OK, I'll tell you what. We've got this blood vessel bioregulator and we've got this bioregulator for the prostate. Yep. How about you give that a shot? And I get a call and I think it was within a month if not a month, like somewhere around four to six weeks, you are not going to believe this, <laughs> but I don't have to get up to go to the bathroom in the night anymore. This is amazing. And so, right. right? So that's a is- real world advantage, right? We can go off on the science all we like, but that is a real world. There's the improvement right there. Right there. And and with something that is, and, and frankly, modern medicine has nothing for that. Or if they do, uh, it's some ha- hellacious, whatever, that's going to have... 27 other problems. It it concerns me, and not only as I get older, but it concerns me that I'm hearing from too many men with prostate problems. Just too, far too many. There's something really bad going on uh, in that department. There are other approaches, of course, but no, I think the prostate peptide is uh, very... And by the way, I think the Russians call that two capsules a day for 30 days. They call that an intensive course. Right. Because normally, as you know, Natalie, you'd do it for 10 days. Correct. Maybe every month, maybe every two, maybe every three. But you rarely would do it for more than two capsules a day, 10 days a month. But when you go on intensive, so they do make often the recommendation to always start there. If you have a problem. If I have a client who has an issue, I will often, with those bioregulators that I, I believe can be helpful to the system that's being challenged, if you will, I will often start them at two capsules, 30 days, and then we go to the 10 days a month for a couple of months. That's why the peptides are produced in 60 capsule packs and 20 capsule packs. Yeah, for sure. That's the reasoning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, although you've done a nice job with the Nature's Marvels to give people flexibility that you put three 20 capsule packs together and that kind of adds up to the same price as the 60 capsule packs. We do that, that, exactly. But but isn't that great in some ways because – a lot of other medicines or hormones or other things, you would be taking them far more frequently and you would almost certainly be taking them daily, yeah. every day. Whereas with these peptides, you may have to go through one month of taking them daily, but after that, it, it's probably not more than 10 days a month. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, I think what's interesting about that, and so, and there are instances I've read about also in the literature where they'll go, if it's, if it's a, if the issue is, is, pronounced enough or severe enough, they might even do two months of of two capsules a day for two months, or they might do four capsules a day for one and sometimes even two months in extreme cases. I think that's more rare, but, and then go to the 10 days. But one of the ideas that we talked about before this podcast, which I'm a huge fan of, is this concept of pulsing. And what I will often say to clients who are like, well, shouldn't I just stay on the bioregulator every day for a long time. And what I will often, I think what I, what I invite people to consider is imagine what we're asking the body to do, right? Mm -hmm. If we're giving the body a signal to upregulate the production of proteins that could restore form and function and rejuvenate, would it not be smart to give the signal and then stand back and let the work happen before we do that? It's a little bit like when we work out heavily We build muscle not during that workout. We build the muscle after the workout. That's right. No, that's very true. To go back to hormones again, let's say you have a thyroid problem Mm -hmm. and you start taking one of the thyroid medications or maybe the natural pig thyroid, whatever. What you're doing is you're delivering that hormone directly into your blood to go and attach itself to the receptors that will be expecting thyroid, basically. I'm trying to put it in a simple way. Um, and, you, and therefore, you need to do it virtually every day because it's there, it's not there, it's there, it's not there, etc. It gets eliminated. But with these peptides, they're not attaching to receptors. They're no. attached directly to DNA yeah. in order to send a signal 
to say, go and do that job. In, in this case, go and produce more thyroid hormones. Now, the only thing I can't get a handle on, to be precise, is once you've activated or silenced particular genes, how long does that message last for? Right. Yeah, that's now, a great question. One, we do know one thing. That message lasts a lot longer if you use the natural peptides as yes. a virus, as opposed to the synthetics. Right. Okay. Um, but how much longer? But I think this is the reasoning why it obviously has a relatively long period. And I think that it's at least a month, I would suggest, which is why in most cases you're taking the capsules for 10 days and not bothering to do it again for another four weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it might be longer in some cases. It might be shorter in some cases. I, I don't know. I think I told you this before we started. I, I went on a self experiment. So the last couple of months I've been doing a lot of traveling and different things. And it's hard when you're going abroad to take everything with you. So I decided like, okay. you reach a point sometimes, don't you? You you've read things, you 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 talk to people, you watch videos, whatever, and you think, oh, I'll do this and I'll do that or whatever. And you build up a program or whatever that program <laughs> is. And there comes a point where you say to yourself, Am I wasting my time? Is this stuff really doing anything for me? You know. Mm -hmm. So I decided, and, and in fact, this weekend I decided to stop it. I decided to take nothing for two months. Mm -hmm. I mean, typically a washout period in the drug world is three weeks. Okay. Yeah. But I thought I'll go beyond that because with the peptides, we know that they're, they're longer lasting. So I thought I'll, I'll do nothing for eight weeks, basically, is what I said to myself. And I, that time is now up. And yes, it's made a lot of difference. I, I feel tired. I've been sleeping more. Um, but I haven't had the energy levels, concentration levels. My lipid profiles have not moved in the right direction. Uh, my blood pressure has gone up. Everything I was monitoring, simple stuff, I wasn't doing deep dive stuff, but simple stuff, everything has moved in the wrong direction. My blood sugar levels are up, you know. So, well, and and you, yeah. And we can compound that also, of course, with the fact that you're on holiday or you're away from home. Oh, so you're not yeah. eating as well. You're not sleeping as well. You're not possibly, you know, whatever your routine around fitness is, that's kind of gone out the window. So you get this kind of compounding that's effect of, of, of both removing. I mean, it's funny because I am a bit of a fan of taking a break once in a while, yeah, but yeah. I think that it's, I think two months is a long time for starters. Yeah. Maybe a yeah. month might have been more reasonable, but <laughs> Um, but my but, old, but, my but, old mentor was a guy, Dr. Ward Dean. Yeah. And then you can go and look him up. He's an amazing guy, Ward. Um, and he used to argue that the break period should either be one week a month or every weekend. So well, I'd that's be honest, a good idea. That's another great schedule. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's normally what I do, actually. I would take my supplements in the, apart from when I'm on a, a length of peptides, but mm -hmm. let's say vitamin C, vitamin D, other things that I take, you know, I will take them in the week and not take them at weekends. That's been my regime for many years. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think that the other thing to think about with the bioregulators though, is when we're doing these 10 day courses, we're never giving the same stim, we're not giving the same stimulus to the body ever. Right. We're doing 10 days of, let's say, pineal blood vessel and thymus. Then I might do th 10 days of parathyroid, thyroid and cartilage or adrenal or, you know, so so we're going to we're going to be sending we're go always going to be sending a signal, but we're sending different signals at different times. Yeah. Now, there is one there's an area where I think that's really interesting. Well, there's many areas that are interesting in this, but but when it comes to the immune system, um, you know, there's particular situations that really challenge our immune system. And one of them is treatment for things like cancer, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So a person gets an unfortunate diagnosis of cancer, they, for whatever, they have to go for treatment. We know mm -hmm. that those treatments very often are very harmful to the immune system. Mm -hmm. I've always thought about, and there is a passage in Marius's book about using bioregulators after the treatment to help the, to restore, like to help the immune system to kind of come back to itself. Do you have any experience with that? Do you have any thoughts on that concept? And I think he was talking specifically about Villon and um, 
maybe the th- probably thymus. Yeah, yeah. It's of course the big C um, is the toughest thing to answer because it's so many different things. Oh yeah, uh, no, for sure. And you, I'm not saying for treating the big C uh, at all. No, I'm talking no. post treatment. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's two things I think that stand out, um, and it's not just in the peptide world. One of the most talked about, dare I use this word, alternative. Um, when when I use the word alternative, I don't mean unscientific or what I'm just talking about. None Other or, than, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is melatonin. And, um, you know, it, it has a highly protective effect and it seems to have a highly curative effect. May I use that term? And I'm referring here specifically to the work of Professor Reiter, who showed that tumors do not grow at nighttime, they only grow at daytime. Mm-hmm. And then on to the work of Frank Schallenberger, Dr. Frank Schallenberger from Nevada, who gives his patients, very high cancer patients, very high dosages of melatonin in the daytime, mm-hmm. which is unheard of, without making them drowsy. Yeah. And a normal person would be zonked out because we're talking about 180 to 240 milligrams yeah, during the which day. Is which is crazy time. No, it's it's, it's crazy dose. <laughs> it is a nice dose. So let's take that as a given, if we may. Then the argument would be then the pineal peptide would mm-hmm. be protected because it's going to make your body help to make more melatonin. I think that would be a given. Um, and, of course, the thymus because yeah. a strong immune system is a key to preventing damages from all kinds. And I think there's a strong argument that should patients go down the route of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, et cetera, they're going to smash their immune system. Oh, That's gosh, a- yeah. Well, yeah. and they we, they see it, right? I mean, they experience it. Exactly. Um, and actually, and and there is actually on the geroprotector side, right? The pineal gland, the pineal bioregulator, and also Vilon, which is which is also an immune bioregulator. But I think it's it's isn't its origin more in the spleen, or is it also from the thymus somehow? Do it is know? thymus as well. Yeah, it, it is, is thymus as well. Anyway, I, both of those there are studies, at least in mice, that shows that yeah. they have anti tumor action. Yes, that's right. That's right. I mean, you've got that triangle that I've often spoken about and that was the triangle that was predominantly, not solely, but predominantly used in those very long human trials that were done in the Soviet Union of the pineal, the thymus, the blood vessel. Yeah. Yeah. You know, those studies are jaw dropping. They are amazing. Nobody, no pharmaceutical cut apart from the famous Framington study, which was just monitoring people over many years. Um, I don't, you know, th- to take eleven thousand people and monitor them for up to twelve <laughs> years is just unheard of. Yeah, you know. So, but they well, used to do that kind of thing in the Soviet Union. <laughs> well, and you know, it was a different time, I guess, because I don't even know that they do it now. But the Gazprom study, I thought, was really interesting because that one was they gave five bioregulators for one month and after a year noticed that those, those employees, and that was 8,000 people that not only did they have a lower incidence of, of respiratory issues. And now we're talking about people working in a, in a gas, um, in uh, Siberia, in Siberia. So they're in (laughs) Siberia, they're working at a gas plant. They're probably smokers because that's kind of part of the culture and so well, what did they gave them? They gave, And what was interesting is they didn't give them the pineal bioregulator in that study. They gave them the brain one, the central nervous system, but they gave mm. them lung, they gave them a blood vessel. Um, I can't remember the other two. But what was interesting is not only did they have fewer respiratory illnesses than the people who only got the suckers who only got the polyvitamins, um, right. but but productivity improved. Yeah, that's right. And and they took segments of, the, of course, they started with people aged between sort of 45 and 60. Yeah. And of course, time was rolling on. So these people got older, obviously. And then they took other groups. So at the end group, um, there was a group of about a thousand who went on for a very long period. And the very end group, and I forgive me, I don't remember the numbers, it was a few hundred, who I think ended up only on the pineal uh, peptide but what they show and of course we're now talking about people in you know going up into their 70s and 80s uh and which was which is pretty long lived in in that, that time in soviet union because russia doesn't have 
uh, the longer uh, longevity tables, some of the countries in the Eastern European bloc as the yeah. Western European bloc. Anyway, that's another story. Maybe, as you say, too many smokers, too many heavy spirit drinkers. That's probably the main reason. Um, but the um, the thing was, there was those magic numbers again. Not, not only were they seeing um, uh, anywhere between 30 and 60 something percent reduction in um, uh, morbidities, in all in all cause morbidities by the people on the peptides, but they ended up seeing a thirty percent or thirty to forty percent reduction in mortality. Yeah, we yeah. come back to that number again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they just you, they, they're harder to you be, they become harder to kill. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and if we can be you know get ourselves to be harder to kill, then we're we're kind of ahead of the game. You know, one thing that comes to mind. You were talking about the bone marrow bioregulator earlier, and and you know, there's obviously the bone marrow, and and you know, I think it's so interesting. People, we go out and we we pay for stem cell treatments. Let's say, and I think we sometimes dismiss this power that the this potential, this reserve potential that we all hold in our bone marrow, and although our red marrow from our being a child turns into yellow marrow as we age. There's a gentleman that I've interviewed um, whose name is Christian Drapeau, and he makes this really interesting supplement, which allows, which, which stimulates the body to release stem cells into circulation. And he talks about sometimes, you know, if in illness and older age, we have fewer stem cells in circulation. Mm. But imagine that you take your bone marrow bioregulator and you're shoring up, maybe you're helping to shore up the, either the production or the quality of stem cells in your bone marrow. And then you pair it with a supplement that helps to release those stem cells into the circulation. Yeah. Yeah. How interesting is that? And is. how fun would it be to play with that when we have, let's say you have an injury or a wound or something that you're trying to address and doing yeah. that little end of one experiment. Well, you know, I've seen this before. What happens if I do this? <laughs> yeah. No, I think you're right, Nathalie. I think that the good news is that there are still lots of stem cells in us as we age, but they seem to need a wake up call. Yeah. They seem to just be sitting there. But most stem cells go to work when they see a trauma. Okay? Exactly. Oh, one, cut your hand, you watch it heal, right? And unfortunately, of course, when cancer goes awry, because that's our cells not dying, right? Not going through apoptosis. It's not some mm -hmm. mysterious material that's come into us. Um, it's often stem, they call them um, cancer stem cells. They won't stop growing. You know, yeah. they, that's why the tumor gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Just very briefly, I'll touch on this. I know we've spoken about it before, but an Italian surgeon by the name of Valero de Nicola Mm -hmm. Valero worked with the University of Rome. He's published this some years ago. The published results in a PubMed journal, which I forget which one it was, but it's out there if anyone puts his name in, um, was on 400 patients. But at the at Rome, they've done 2,000 patients. What on earth am I talking about? Well, all these patients who were sort of age 40 to <clears throat> sort of 70 <clears throat> were all told they needed a new knee or a new hip. <clears throat> replacement, excuse me. And Valero and his team had this idea that if they could use heat shock proteins, mm -hmm. they could wake up what are known as mesenchymal stem cells. Um, and they'd like to see what happens. So what they do is they extract <clears throat> 10 milliliters of blood from the patient. They effectively torture that blood. <clears throat> excuse me. I should have a tea, I think. Anyway, yeah. should, um, well, they, if you they, have they, something, go ahead and drink it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel better. The frog is gone. Um, and um, because they're inside. And when they finish with it overnight, this is, it, I've seen it. It looks like a piece of red chewing gum. Uh, but it's your blood, right? It's your heat shock proteins from your blood. And let's say it's a knee. Well, they know where the stem cell clusters are on the capsule. So the surgeon with a three millimeter cut, it's very small. So it's not penetrating the capsule. It's just, you know, if you fell off your bicycle, you'd have cuts like that. Right. They, they make those cuts where the mesenchymal stem cells are. They push in your now concentrated heat shock proteins from the day before. They stitch it up and you go home. It's light. It's simple. It's can you imagine a knee operation or God forbid a hip operation? It's major surgery. Um, most folks do well on one. Some folks have two. 
Some folks have three. All those patients, the 400 in the published study, the 2,000 that they've actually done at the University of Rome, all negated the need for a knee or, knee or hip. And um, that's been like that for five years now. Wow. So, What's his name? Ta- Valero, Valero is his first name. Di, D-I, middle name. Nicola, N-I-C-O-L-A. Um I know, I know Valero is a lovely, lovely guy, and we're trying to help him get this off the ground because it's such a breakthrough, really. No when kidding. Off the but this is the power of stem cells when they're instructed. Mm-hmm. When they get the do, right, yeah, they get the right stimulus, really. The, the pain goes in 10 days, and over the course of three months, the cartilage regrows. That's crazy. So, okay. And this is older people as well, because sometimes when people are particularly elderly, they're told they're not going to give the surgery to them because it's too dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they have no option, but this could be done because it's very minor surgery. Well, and it's your own material. Like, you know what, what I think is, you know, it's so funny on this, on the whole stem cell journey right now. I mean, of course, there's still a lot of interest and a lot of work, really great work being done with umbilical cord stem cells, like stem cells from 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 neonatal material, if you will, right? Mm-hmm. But I think what's also really interesting right now is this resurgence or this continued interest in autologous stem cells. So the stem cells that we, like what we're talking about right now, right? So yeah. these are stem cells of that person, which inherently right away reduces a whole lot of, problems and questions and potential mm. issues in exactly. terms of compatibility and and whatnot and and you know like I, even like this area of very small stem cells i don't know if you've heard about these but these are like tiny little embryonic stem cells we all have in our bloodstream but they're dormant to your mm. point and so mm. there are there are now therapies where people are d- doing a blood draw spinning out the blood reactivating those cells with a laser, like a red laser, and then reintroducing them into the body. Mm. And so either systemically or they're being used for aesthetics, they're being used for joints, for all kinds of stuff. So, you know, it's so funny because we were talking earlier about, oh gosh, you know, AI is coming and this is coming and that's coming. It's a really scary time. But at the same time, it's a really exciting time because there's the regenerative and the all of these therapies and 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 as you say you know you bring in the stem cells but then you bring in the bioregulator that's going to flip those switches and ask for the regeneration in a specific area exactly. and might that attract the stem cells to that area to contribute to the renewal and regeneration yeah. and we yeah. could have a really very powerful partnership we here we could i mean preventative medicine is great Absolutely, Absolutely great. But regenerative medicine is about as, as exciting as it can get, right? Because if you've already got the problem, preventative medicine isn't going to help, obviously, because yeah. you've already got it. So, but to regenerate, and and God forbid we actually get to use the word rejuvenate. Mm-hmm. So uh, <laughs> um, that's the ultimate word, isn't it? Um, yeah. But but uh, no, I think it's very exciting, and and it, it's all about encouraging and. It, that's the work of Aubrey de Grey's foundation and people like mm-hmm. that really mm-hmm. all about repairing the cell back to a, a, a youthful, if I can use that word, yeah. uh, normal, if you prefer um, action. Uh, and then the body does what it, what it does best. I mean, we all, ne- we all remember what it was like to be 2025. 20, we didn't have to worry about what virtually what we did. Our body would be fine the following morning. Correct. Um, Correct. But but I will bring up again that, you know, cell renewal is really interesting, but let's pay attention to the health of the cell membrane. Let's pay attention to the lipids that we're consuming so that the cell membrane has the right fats to incorporate into the membrane. Like I do, I think we do need to continually bring ourselves back to what are the, what is needed for that healthy whether it's a cell or tissue or whatever, like for people who are like the the woman in my group who got these amazing results by taking the thyroid bioregulator in her blood work inside of a month, you know, most likely she wasn't iodine deficient. She wasn't using, you know, she wasn't exposing herself to goitrogens because stimulating the thyroid to produce more thyroid hormone is great, but is your T4 being converted to T3? 
you know, are you loaded up with chlorine and fluoride that's occupying the iodine receptors? Like, yeah, there's you're taking me back here a bit, Natalie, because uh, I had the pleasure of introducing, and I'm very pleased to say he's still kicking, uh, <laughs> Professor Imbri Naji from Hungary. Mm-hmm. And Imbri, it holds the uh, um, the membrane hypothesis of aging. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you can look, go and look it up. But there were, hey, guess what? We interviewed him for the magazine, which is Aging Matters. He's, he's articles on the IS website. And, you know, you can go, there's a book on the shelf behind me, which is his book. All those techie books are very expensive, by the way, but they can be sought. And his whole um, theory was that the membrane is actually the most important part of the cell. Yeah. Um, because it's it's there, of course, as a as a guardian, and also to allow things to enter and to allow things to exit. And he showed through various experiments that even small changes, what are comparatively small changes, uh, particularly to the um, the water content of the cell, mm-hmm. so the cell starts to dehydrate, had massive implications on the functioning of that cell. Mm-hmm. So on one level, you might say, oh, it's 8% down on its, you know, on its water content. But that actually translated into extremely significant changes in the cell's performance. And the other thing he showed that he hypothesized was an issue for aging that even today nobody talks about, as far as I'm aware, is heat. How heat damages a membrane. Okay, and I'm not just talking about sitting out in the sun, of course, but the ongoing, the damage that that does. So, yeah, so you're absolutely right. Um, the way a cell performs is absolutely fine. And then where is that cell located, right? Yeah, is, sure. is it in, which tissue is it in? Which organ is it in? Which gland is it in? It will impact that that thing, you yeah. know, and, and to have that, to have those on necessary damage. It's also, this, it, it kind of goes a little bit hand in glove with the mitochondrial theory of aging, yes. which presupposes that the mitochondria get damaged. And they way. do. And they do. Well, and I mean, Not- all these theories of aging are valid. And the truth of the matter is there's never going to be one thing. <laughs> no. no, that's, 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 a- by the way, I've, I've got to tell you this, because you know, I like funny stories. Uh, mitochondria, as we get older, what happens to them is they get larger in size and f- although somewhat fewer in number, but much more inefficient. It, mm-hmm. It's just like government. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so many things. And indeed. And they never want to leave. No. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to leave. Like they, they're kind of they're kind of dysfunctional and broken, not doing much. They're kind of grumpy and they don't want to go. Exactly. I know. Yeah. No, listen. But you know what's interesting about these theories? You've got the hallmarks of aging. You've got the membrane hypothesis of aging. You even have Kevinson has the peptide theory of aging, right? Yeah, There's yeah. all these and at the end and and in the end. Every one of them is valid. And so I wish we would we would move on from, oh, this is the reason we age or that's the reason we age and start to understand, like, what is the constellation of issues involved in aging that we need to? There's, we, there's a lot of hands in gloves. So, for example, yeah. sometimes it's hard to separate the free radical theory of aging from the glycation theory of aging. Correct. Yeah. And other such things. They're, they're all da- they're all accumulated damages. So the argument becomes, how do you slow down the rate of accumulation of damages? And possibly more fundamentally, how do you eradicate the damages? Exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, it's, it's, again, we look at the nine hallmarks of aging and if we can address the protein miss, like reduce protein misfolding, restore autophagy, get apoptosis in line, uh, like working the way it's supposed to. Um, now there's these three hallmarks with the inflammation, the inflammaging, like all that stuff. But if we can, and, and it's, it's what we've, we've been talking about this whole podcast is going at each one of these issues and then bring your bioregulators in, right? Yeah. So yeah. improve the that whole environment, get rid of the cellular kind of, co- improve the cellular function and environment, if you will, and mm. now restore those signals that says, hey, make me some, you know, make yeah. refresh it's my a, pancreas for me, will you? <laughs> good, good thinking, Natalie. And, and I tell you, I've got to say one thing, because I've been working a lot in, in recent uh, weeks, with rapamycin, okay, yeah. which is a mTOR inhibitor. And there are certain projects that I get involved in. I'm also doing something with dasatinib, which is a very powerful senolytic drug. Yeah. Um, but 
the one thing they have in common is you've got to know what you're doing. Absolutely. You know, oh, you, God. You, yeah, well, they're, they're, yeah. they're the sharpest tools in the box, right? Yeah. The nice thing about the bioregulators is, and I'm going that slightly on a limb here, but I think it's true, is whilst they have efficacy, they're also extraordinarily safe. Absolutely. So, you know, people can do some, dare I say this word, self-experimentation, mm-hmm. that kind of product, in the same way you would do with a lot of vitamins and minerals, I guess. For sure. So whereas other things can also be very powerful and are, are of great interest, but either you should be working with health professionals or you really do need to know what you're doing. Oh yeah, no. I mean, listen. You or there's that protein GDF11 that pe- that people use in picograms, which can be transformational if used yeah. properly, and can destroy yeah. you if you if you overdo it. So it is. These are you know the desatinibs and the rapamycins, and that's why you know there's some really interesting senolytic herbal formulas around. That mm-hmm. you know, if you're not confident and wanting to use something as toxic as a desatinib, sure. for example, you can go to these herbal formulas wield them a couple of days a month and get really great results at the same time. Maybe yeah. it's not going to take out as many cells, but yeah. it'll at least reduce your load to allo- allow you to function better. Yeah, people are looking at quisetin, which is yeah. the other flavonoid from the grape that lots of people know about resveratrol, and also uh, fisetin, which I believe – yeah. Yeah. yeah, it mainly comes from strawberries, if I remember, if I remember right. Yeah, although I think you need like a truckload of oh. strawberries to get your hundred milligrams or whatever it is. But um, you had mentioned something that you wanted to touch on at the beginning of the podcast, and maybe as we're coming up on our, let's say, our last quarter hour together, um, you had mentioned the GHRPs, and of course, we know yeah. growth hormone is another one of these, and and growth hormone is also really interesting in context of what we've just been talking about because restoring improved growth hormone levels as we age because they decline, it can be really rejuvenating. And yet going too far on the wrong side of growth hormone can be pro-aging, right? It can accelerate aging and lead to all kinds of issues. But there was something in the growth hormone, the growth hormone receptor peptide world that you wanted to touch on. So yeah, I'd love to. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah. I mean, uh, probably starting back in about 90, early nineties, mid nineties, when Ron Klatz, Dr. Ron Klatz came out with the book Grow Young with Growth, Growth Hormone, um, it's been a lot of interest, or even going back further than that, with a guy called Dr. Daniel Rudman in the 1980s, who gave his aging patients injections of growth hormone and watched all kinds of biomarkers change in very favor, like fat, you know, loss of fat, gain of muscle mass, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's still true today that in terms of uh, certainly physical uh, attributes and possibly even mental attributes to some degree, mm-hmm. there's nothing more powerful than growth hormone. Um, you you will see differences in several weeks, I mean, quite significant differences. Um, and so as a result of that, of course, there was a massive charge towards growth hormone of interest. But as you rightly said, it's very easy to overdose on it and you can get into all kinds of other areas which are not at all uh, anti-aging um so there was argue there was arguments for many 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 years about what is the right dose of growth hormone and i think the bottom line is in terms of healthy aging um it's very difficult to dose with the very small amounts be- unless you can get a compounding pharmacy to make them for mm-hmm. you no pharmaceutical company makes a low dose of a low enough dose of growth hormone why because their target is for stunted growth. Yeah. Well, and it's also very expensive and very hard to get. Yes. As as a healthy aging compound, right? That's right. I mean, I, back in the day when I experimented myself with it, um, I I just can't think of the manufacturer's season, I think it was, and uh, by Serrano, I think it was, and they used to produce it in 0.2 milligrams, which was really low at Mm -hmm. the time smallest one they did but then i got to meet a guy called dr richard walker and you can look rich up he lives in florida and he has done a lot of work with what's called ghrps which is growth hormone releasing peptides yeah and i interviewed him there's a video of me talking to him on the anti-aging systems channel on um, youtube and he's in our magazine etc 
some years ago now. It's not, it's not recent. And he told me a couple of things which I found very interesting. Um, the three principal GHRPs he studied were GHRP2, GHRP6, and Semirelin. Mm-hmm. And Semirelin is quite unique. Perhaps we'll come back to that. So GHRP2, GHRP6, they're agonists. In other words, they assist the pituitary gland to make more growth hormone. And as I think most of us know, past the age of 35, our growth hormone levels in blood go down very significantly, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And the stre- although the strange thing is, according to Rich, the pituitary gland keeps making good amounts of growth hormone, but for some reason loses the ability to put it into blood. To release it. To release it. And that could be the role of semirelin. Yeah, it's a gro- it, it helps it to release, yeah. To release. So his uh, point on this, uh, uh, Dr. Walker, is semirelin isn't acting as an agonist. It's acting as a release agent. Now, it happens to be, I uh, hope I get my memory serving me right here, the first 39 amino acids of the 191 amino acids of human growth hormone, That what's called a precursor. Mm-hmm. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means you can inject it. You can't take it orally. It's still too long. Um, but you could use it as an intranasal and possibly as a sublingual. Okay. Really? So that, yeah. Yeah, it could be possible. Um, so that's very useful. Uh, although I would suggest to you, if you're over 50-ish, it's not going to have that big an impact on you unless you do something else. And I'll come to that. So GHRP2, GHRP6 are in a similar boat. However, it turns out that GHRP6 works quite well sublingually. So that's Mm -hmm. people who don't like injecting all day. That could be a a nice thing. But basically, these things are either best injected, intranasal, and possibly sublingual in some cases, but not orally. No. Well, you know, the interesting thing on the GHRP2 and 6 is they, they, you know, they're they're often looked at in the peptide world as – the, the challenge that they present, I think, is that they also come with an increase in prolactin, an increase in cortisol, and they can make people very hungry. So, yeah. Yeah, know, so my understanding is those two are better. They're more useful, for example, for an older population that's lost appetite, like people yeah. who they, they can't they almost can't eat enough, like elderly people or yeah. they get used more often in the bodybuilding community. Of course, yeah. not particularly legally. Uh, I, growth hormone, though, has some of those attributes as well. For sure. If I, if I was to mention what is now an illegal drug, although for decades it wasn't, which is GHB, gamma hydroxybutrate, which is in every cell of our body. Oh, it's a huge story. I'm not even, I don't think we should get it. <laughs> but it was, it would put you to sleep and it got used by some nefarious males for date rape and, and that's why it got banned. But but for, for, for people suffering with insomnia, it was a lifesaver because they'd get five hours of sleep every night. But because of that, it also increased growth hormone. It's, it's, right. a, a, lot of, a lot of the reason we want to wake up and get going in the morning is we get a, the biggest pulsite release of growth hormone into the blood first thing in the morning. So here's the problem, right? Really? If, I didn't realize if, that. I thought it was cortisol. Okay. The other, and I'm cortisol. not saying it's the only one, but yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. a lot of hormones get released big time in the morning as that kind of impetus to, to get up and go. Get up and go. Um. But here's the thing, right? So if we go back to one of my um, most favorite physicians, which is Dr. Jonathan Wright, Dr. Jonathan B. Wright, Jonathan would always say that he likes everything natural. And he would say things like, uh, or he does say things like, um, if we get it wrong in medicine, it's only three things. We're, We're using the wrong molecule. We're using the wrong dose. We're using the wrong timing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a lot of common sense there. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the problems with taking an injection of growth hormone um, is what you're going to, even if you're taking a small dose, like 0.2 milligram, and it could even be a lot lower than that, um, you get this big bolus increase in blood of growth hormone. You're not mimicking nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what Rich Walker had alerted me to was if you looked at growth hormone over a 24-hour period on your graph in blood, you'll see the biggest rate of increase in the morning, but you'll actually watch several more Mm -hmm. 
much smaller pulsite releases a growth hormone during the day okay yeah. pretty during the day so what's fascinating is when you take something like ghrp2 and he's done he's got the studies on this you see an increase to each yeah. of these pulse site mm-hmm. weight. so it's mimicking nature which has got to be a good thing now sure. when i asked rich walker what did he believe the right dose of injected growth hormone was for the average human he said <clears throat> 0.05 milligrams. So tiny, tiny, tiny amount. It's tiny. It's hard to do. Yeah. You'd have to get a compounding pharmacist to organize it for you. Okay. Yeah. Can be done? Of course. I'm, 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 I'm definitely on the GHRP, GHRH in that, you know, we've got the growth hormone releasing hormone, which stimu- which actually encourages the release of growth hormone. And we will often pair it with the growth hormone releasing peptide, right? So we get, so we have that famous, like I think one of the most most used combinations in this world right now is the CJC1295, which is yeah. modified growth hormone and ipamorelin together because they yeah. kind of do this, they do, they kind of go through two different pathways. They increase the production and facilitate the release. Yeah. Um, they're not as strong as the GHRP2 and GHRP6, though. That is yeah. – so I think for me, the GHRP2 and GHRP6 are better to use with a physician so that mm-hmm. they can really keep an eye on, you know, maybe the the downsides and make sure what, they're – What a funny story. What a funny true story. Always want a funny true story. <laughs> Shoot. What What is the status of GHRP2 in the United States? Okay. I don't think it's a very I'm... allowed thing. No, it is. <laughs> It is. Is it legal? Yes. You're going to laugh when I tell you. Okay. It is classified as, and it is the, as far as I'm aware, it remains the only substance in this category in the United States. It is classified by the FDA as a medical food. You're joking. So what on earth is a medical food? A medical food is a substance that does not require a prescription, but must be purchased from a doctor. Wow. Never heard of that before, have you? I had no idea. That's so fascinating. <laughs> Weird one, right? Yeah. You guys yeah. should see Phil's face right now. He is so happy with himself. <laughs> <laughs> As he should be, because that's a, quite an interesting nugget. So only GHRP2, not GHRP6? Not as far as I'm aware. Not unless it's changed in recent years and I was unaware of it. But huh. I'm afraid I get excited by weird shit like that. I'm afraid that interests me. Well, you but, know, I uh, think we, <laughs> us little nerdy kind of propeller heads in this world, we all get kind of, you know, and our spouses look at us and go, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think, and of course, what Rich Walker went on to do was he combined in some of his patients GHRP2, because it's principally GHRP2 he went down the rabbit hole of, with semorelin. And he then saw a synergy between those two, which was up to sevenfold in some patients. Wow. So I think that's highly significant. So yeah. that to me is a safer route to go down than injecting yourself with growth hormone. Now, if we go into the work of uh, Thierry Hertog, and perhaps Thierry's the most radical. <laughs> Uh, one of the most radical positions there are, he would even be using IGF-1, um, insulin-like growth factor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of, and and it's a lot of G, um, uh, labs, I'm not very au okay with testing methods, but last time I spoke to the lab guys, they say, if we want to know what growth hormone's doing, we measure IGF-1. Well, it's so, the closest thing they have to... Exactly. Yeah. And that is way more powerful and and now we start putting even more zeros in the dosage. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, I mean, you know, these these things all have to be wielded with a careful hand and an eye to you know, working with someone who's both going to monitor your labs and know what to look for. And I think, you know, definitely even with the growth hormone secretagogues, so the GHRP and GHR GHRHs we see sometimes people, if their dose is too high, you start to see some of those symptoms generated by excess growth hormones. So they'll get swelling and pain in their joints and their hands. like and, and they're like, oh, I think I'm getting carpal tunnel syndrome or something. And the question often is, what is it that you're doing and how much? And, and, right. and 
And it's interesting because what these are doing is they're pushing your endogenous production, your own production of growth hormone, instead of bringing it from the outside, which is yeah. a massive benefit. But even then, there's a possibility of too much of a good thing. So yeah, yeah. So you you've got to be sensible with all these things by the way go back to Thierry very quickly he does produce some of the most marvelous books some of the oh, most expensive books. and there is a book that he produces called the atlas of endocrinology which is pictorial and basically will take you through quite a number of different hormones and show you the physical changes of a, on a patient when they're too low in that hormone and when they're too high in that hormone OK, yeah. and and it is a fantastic reference guide. If you're deep into hormones, then I would say that's a must have. Yeah, it, it's a, I've seen that book. It's a bit of an investment, both, I think, in space and in finances. But it is it is, you know, anything called the Atlas of like this is a reference book. You almost want, you know, you want, almost want it to be one of those books. If you're in this business that's on a stand in your office that you can kind of go flip it through any uh, at any time. Uh, uh, <laughs> No, it's very true. It's very, very true. It's yeah. an awful lot of work. And I'm sure, and he's updated it fairly recently, actually. He's at version two or three, I can't remember, but but he, from time to time, he updates them as well. So always worth looking at. If you're deep in, you know, if you're a health professional or someone who's really, because otherwise, you you know, if you're really deep into this, you can spend an awful lot of money yeah. on these things. And then you might want to know if you're wasting, at the very least, if you're wasting your money. So spending a couple of hundred dollars on a book, you might think is a good investment. I think so. I sure do. All right, sir. I think we're going to wind this up a little bit. So um, why don't we tell people where they can find you and okay. um, how to learn more? I mean, let's talk about the magazine, uh, Thank the, you. The, the store where people can buy bioregulators, um, yeah. <laughs> all the things. Well, sure. I mean, the, the simplest place to go is to a website called antiaging-systems.com. It has been up for the longest time we always adding stuff to it and it is a resource guide it, it will tell you briefly about products it will show you articles by professional people videos podcasts there's some view on there we link to of course Natalie and all sorts of stuff and it's a, we've we've been doing that since 1996 yeah so there's a wealth of material on there um, and then if you want to buy products, it will send you off to stores. It doesn't, that site does not sell, but it will send you off to stores where you can obtain those products. So, so I could give you sites where the, the bioregulator is available, but if you go to antiagingsystems.com, look up the bioregulators, find the one you want, you'll see it will say, the link will say buy from an approved store. Click on that, it will take you to a relevant store. So that's probably the easiest um, yeah. thing I could say. Although my, pers wants my personal mm -hmm. favorite is Profound Health, you know. So if okay. you go to profound-health.com, then you'll yeah. find the bioregulators laid out beautifully there. The stores don't have a lot of information for mm -hmm. legal reasons. Um, but if you, want, if you know what you want, then bang, go to profoundhealth.com and, you know, that, that, that's that sort of thing. Um the other the magazine which you can download mm -hmm. free of charge is aging-matters.com and by the way we secure the word aging both the british spelling and the american spelling so with an e and without an e perfect so don't, don't worry about that so although as my oldest brother likes to when he meets me he's very british he likes to say are you still doing the anti-agging <laughs> Anyway, well, he's but, being silly. You'd need two G's for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's a, a good site as well. I mean, we, we do have a lot of real estate on the internet, but those are probably the two or three principal sites where you can um, you can find a, a lot of stuff. We have stores for uh, the more medical kind of things. We have mm -hmm. stores for the more hormonal side of things as well but antiagingsystems.com will, will always direct by the way i should also mention this has only recently started but we've gone out to our doctor network and we've asked them if they want to be on a register Beautiful. Uh, where when patients say please is there a doctor in my state in my town who can help me with bioregulators or whatever then we hope to be able to say yes here's the list perfect and great so, idea Number one question we get now these days is, is there a health professional within 50 miles of me who can help me do this? 
Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. That'll be a great resource once it's up. And of course, the last thing we'll mention, because, you know, this podcast will probably come out in the summer sometime, by which time it won't be too long before next May 25th, 26th, when you host the next um, Profound Health Summit in uh, in Luton Who, right? Which will be, good. I mean, I missed the four, first one due to an ill-timed illness the week, the day I was supposed to leave down. Um, no, then won't be doing that again. But um, yeah, so that'll be, that's exciting. So people should definitely sign up for your newsletter and stay on top of that. And I'll be blabbing about it anyway, once it's- Thank you, There is a website dedicated to that. Now we're just in the process of asking speakers. Uh, It's going to be May uh, 25, 26, which is a weekend next year, uh, 2024. And um, it's, dare I use this word, it's a high end event. We, we, we're intimate. We are um, very focused on practical information, cutting edge practical information. And it's kind of a workshop because yeah. we want you to come and learn. Yeah. Okay. And and it's in a lovely stately home, which if anyone's watched the film Four Weddings and a Funeral, you've already seen it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so it's, it's just above London. It's it, For those who don't know, Luton Who, it, it's like 40 minutes north of London. So it's easy to get to. There's an airport near it, train station near it, etc. So please, profound-health-summit.com will take you to that website. Amazing. I'm looking forward to it. Phil, as always, thank you so much. It's been an absolute joy. Um, and I will look forward to seeing you in June. Thank you, Natalie. And please keep doing what you do because it's great stuff. Thank you.